Welcome inside Big Ten today. Rick Pizzo thrilled to be joined by Trent Meacham. After a couple of days taking a break from the madness, we get back into NCAA tournament action on Thursday evening. I'm excited about that. I'm sad that we have to say goodbye to the first weekend of the tournament, Trent, because I always think it's the best weekend on the sports calendar. Nothing beats all the madness, all the games, but I will tell you what, Rick. Now the cream has rose to the top. There's a handful of teams that I feel like have elevated their games to another level, two of them being Illinois and Purdue. So we're getting into some great action tonight. I'm looking forward to that. Both Illinois and Purdue terrific in their second round wins. That is where we begin today with the big story. Illinois will be first to tip off the Sweet 16 for the Big Ten, taking on Iowa State Thursday night. It is strength versus strength. One in efficiency offensively for Illinois, one in efficiency defensively for Iowa State. There are a couple of areas on these sides of the ball where each team could be better, but it's strictly offense against defense, which of course means that's what it won't be when they match up tonight just after 10 o'clock Eastern time in the Sweet 16 because the NCAA tournament always provides surprises, if nothing else. Is it that simple, though, Trent? Is it simply a matter of Iowa State trying to limit Illinois' offense and Illinois trying to figure out what the Cyclones do defensively, or is there more to it than that? Well, I would say first off, um, that's that's the biggest thing with this game. I think it makes it such an intriguing matchup because of the strengths versus strengths. There's a saying in basketball, though, good offense beats good defense. Is that true, though? And Well, here's the deal, Rick. It doesn't matter what a defense does, their schemes, how hard they're playing, how good they contest a shot. A good offensive player, if they're, if they're making shots, a good team, if they're running their stuff, getting what they want, and there's sometimes that the defense just can't do anything about a great play on the offensive end. You know, I would prefer the aesthetically pleasing, bucket-getting team, high-powered off. I would prefer that. I, I, I also, from, from how it looks, but also from advancing, winning in a tournament like this. Now, I'll say that there's no guarantee Illinois wins, all right, just because they're the better offensive team. And as I said, a good offense will beat good defense. I mean, Iowa State could totally take Illinois out of what they want to do, force turnovers, force tough shots, get some easy buckets for themselves. But I, I will say, I like the better offensive team, Illinois, in this matchup tonight. I think history proves you to be right, recent history at least. You look at the national champions in recent years, whether you go to Carolina. UConn last year, I think, was a little bit of a hybrid, but even teams that made the national championship game last 10 to 15 years, they all have one thing in common. They can score the basketball. Iowa State doesn't necessarily score the basketball well. Houston is a similar comparison, a team that's had great regular season success, hasn't won it yet under Kelvin Sampson, but they're a team that traditionally makes that run toward the NCAA Final Four. I just think this is a different look for Illinois. I understand Terrence Shannon gets downhill against everybody. I understand that Illinois matches up really well against everybody. I just feel like this is a different look, and this is why, to me, coaching in the NCAA tournament becomes so important because Brad Underwood and that staff have to find a way to put their guys in the best position to score the basketball against a really good defense. That's, yeah, that's a great point. And, and what Iowa State is going to do, one, when you think of Illinois in transition, Terrence Shannon, they're going to try to form a wall, get multiple guys back. You can't stop them with one guy. The, the most uh, – what you see in the NBA is with, with Giannis, okay, the Greek freak in transition. Teams can't get him maybe with one or two players. You've got to really form a wall. Iowa State's going to do that. They play inside out on the defensive end. And then in the half court, and this is why Illinois is so good. you got transition with, with Terrence. Half court, you play through Marcus Damask. Iowa State, and I, heard, and I heard Robbie talk about this yesterday on the show a little bit, somewhat similar to Nebraska. Northwestern does this as well. They're really heavy on the help side. And what they're going to do is on the post defense, they're going to get on the top side of Damask, the top side of Illinois guys, force some baseline, come over with the trap. And so Illinois seen that a little bit this year, but not like what the Cyclones will bring. Their aggressiveness, their activity with their hands, their physicality. And I will say that this NCAA tournament, the rest have let teams play. I think that bodes well for Iowa State, but they're going to bring a lot of pressure to Marcus Damascus because he's the focal point in Illinois' half-court offense. How well he plays out of that, how well Illinois moves the ball without turning the ball over. Look, Iowa State, number one defense, they're number two in forcing turnovers. 25% of possessions, they're forcing a turnover. If Illinois can value the basketball, move the ball well, knock down shots, and also, Rick, Iowa State's not great on the boards. 
And one of that is because of their strong help side defense, they're in rotations. If Illinois gets high quality looks, can get to the offensive glass as well. I do like Illinois scoring, but they're going to have to take care of the ball. I think it'll be tough to score in the half court, and that's why I think the Illinois defense may be the biggest key to them being able to do what they want to do offensively because if you force Iowa State into bad possessions or at least bad shots, you're a better rebounding team. And if you rebound, that means you can get out in transition. And I don't care how good your defense is. To me, that's the biggest advantage Illinois has over every team left in the tournament is the guy over your shoulder. It's Terrence Shannon Jr. Because when he's getting downhill in transition, especially off misses, going as fast as he can potentially go, there's no defense. There's no single defender in the country that can deal with that. Yes, you know, Illinois struggled at times getting stops. But if they can get stops, now you ha you're playing ahead of the defense. And you don't want that Iowa State defense to get set. As good as Illinois has been in the half court, playing through Damask, if you can get out in transition, Terrence Shannon lean the way. You got guys like Gary A., Rodgers, even Dane Danger running the court. That's where they're at their best. That's where they're going to get the highest quality looks. They get to the free throw line, put some pressure on the defenses. And I'll, I'd also say, Rick, you talk about – coaching in the NCAA tournament, I've been really impressed with how Brad Underwood has used a guy like Dane Danger, who really fell out of the rotation a number of times. He was buried on the bench for a long time. And, and you know, give credit to the coaching staff for giving those opportunities, but also for, for Danger for sticking with it. And now he's had some big, big games here recently. He's allowed Coleman Hawkins to go to the four. Now this is a really big team because you know their guards are big. you got a legitimate center in Danger who's great footwork, great hands, an effective offensive player. Coleman can match up defensively against the fours where he's at his best and he can, and he can help more. So that's been a critical, like, involvement just in recent weeks for Illinois. We'll see what tonight brings because every game is unique in, in and of its own. And Iowa State, with their physicality, with how they play, I really like their point guard, a sophomore, Taman Lipsy. Really just a two-way two player, can knock down difficult shots, and he's a guy that if Iowa State is, is making this a slugfest, he's the guy that can break down a defense and give them an edge on that end of the floor. I'm going to put you on the spot here. We know Damask and Shannon are the two most important players for Illinois, certainly offensively, perhaps not on the defensive end. But if I were to ask you, who's the third most important player if either Damask and or Shannon is limited by Iowa State and you know the Cyclones are going to try to do exactly that, Who's the next most important guy for the Illini? You could go a number of ways. You could go Danger. That's why I asked you the Luke, question. Luke, Luke Goody has had moments where he, he's really opened up a game. But it's, it's clear to me, Rick, and that would be Coleman Hawkins. Because of his versatility, he's gone for 30 points in a game. He can, he can facilitate from that 4-5 position defensively. He's so versatile. He's always an X factor because of his talent because of all the, the, the myriad of things he can do on the court offensively and defensively, he can be a game buster, bringing, bringing a big away from the basket, attacking the basket, facil facilitating, does so many different things. If he's playing at a high level, that's what takes this Illinois team to, I think, uh, the next level as a team. Lastly, from a mentally side, it's been a minute since Illinois has <laughs> been to the Sweet 16. None of these guys with the Illini have experienced it. How much does that play into it it is a is it a complete non-factor because most of that history has not included the roster that we'll see on Thursday night well I think what matters Rick is is they value they know the importance of this opportunity these are experienced players sometimes if you're a bunch of freshmen or sophomore you get to a sweet 16 you think hey this is just what happens this is an every year occurrence I think these guys, they've had enough experience at the college level, whether playing some in the NCAA tournament, not making the NCAA tournament like a Marcus Damask. They value this. They appreciate that. I think it's going to pay off. It's interesting, their approach. It seems a little bit more um, fun versus the Purdue like business-like approach. And I don't think there's one right or wrong. Obviously, when you step on the court, you're business. You're, you're, you're there to play. But Illinois seems to be loose, seems to be free. I think they value it, and that's what's most important mentally. Are you measuring out your coffee consumption as of now? Young kids at home, tips not until 9, 15-ish Central Time. Are you going to make it? Oh, hey, Sweet 16, it's been, what, 20 years almost for, for, for Illinois to be at this moment. So I'm going to make it. I don't know if my young kids will tonight, though. I think that's fair. We'll check in with Trent about 1130 on Thursday night to see if he is still up and rolling with the Illini as they take on Iowa State in the late game on Thursday night and the start of the Sweet 16 for the Big Ten. And while the Illini tip off Thursday, Friday belongs to the Boilers. We look at Purdue's Sweet 16 matchup against a very familiar foe when Big Ten Today returns right after this. 
Time for today's big stat presented by Walgreens brings us back to the first meeting of the year between Purdue and Gonzaga some four months ago out in Hawaii. Bulldogs led at the half, but Purdue outscored the Zags 43-28 after the break. You see that huge edge in paint points. And take a look at the three-point field goals. Gonzaga shot 32 triples and made just six as the Boilers won it. 73-63, this during their unbelievable run out in Hawaii to start the year. Back here in our Big Ten Today studios, Rick Pizzo and Trent Meacham. I found it interesting that Matt Painter said after Purdue's second round win, that game means nothing. Gonzaga is a completely different team than it was when we played them back in November. Are you buying what Coach Painter is selling? I, I am. I mean, both teams are so different at this point in the season. I think you can take elements from that game. Okay, how did Gonzaga guard Zach Eady? You know, mostly straight up one-on-one. We'll see what each game is unique. Each game is different in and of its own, um, especially from four or five months later. So you can't take too much. The one thing I look at is that three-point line, Rick. You, you saw six for, th for 32 for Gonzaga. They were 0 for 13 in the second half. So they had a lead at halftime. If they would have shot the ball better, maybe it's a different game. I think I do think the three-point line will be critical tonight. Purdue has been so good there throughout the course of the season. Number one in the country, over 41%. Obviously, that starts with Zach Eady. So much attention on him. These guys are taking horse shots. But for Gonzaga, pretty much their whole team outside of Ike, and he maybe even hit a three in that first matchup, shoots the three ball pretty well. So for Purdue, Defending the three-point line will be critical, and then also those guys stepping forward with confidence shooting the three on the offensive end will be so important. I'm glad you used that word confident because right now the confidence for the Boilermakers has to be sky high. As good as Illinois was against Duquesne in its second round, you could make the argument that Purdue was the most dominant second-round performance. UConn fans might have something to say about that. The Boilers were unbelievable against Utah State. To me, the interesting scenario is, and what we expect to be a closer game, do any of those nerves and the ghosts of the past come back? Because Purdue hasn't had to worry about that in the first weekend because they got off to such great starts in each of those two games. Nerves are always there. That's part of the game. That's part of what makes it well, fun. Well, nerves are and, a good and, thing. And, and, yes, yes. But where you don't want to tighten up. Correct. And that's what's so important. I think getting past that first weekend – will help. Now you're playing a big brand in Gonzaga. This is not a layup like you would maybe expect against a 16 seed. Uh, so, but but they got to shoot it with confidence. They got to play with confidence. You know, the guards, Brain Smith, um, Lance Jones, those guys have not had the offensive production in recent weeks. I think Smith, three out of the last four games in single digits. Jones, the last three in single digits. Now look, with this roster, they don't need them to produce like that every night but they're going to have opportunities and they're going to have to capitalize when they have them. Zach Eady has been the focal point, not just for Purdue, the Big Ten or college basketball, but for the nation. He's taken some shots about the way he is officiated both sides, that he doesn't get enough calls. And then there are those who say he gets way too many and shoots too many free throws. You mentioned Gonzaga going basically one-on-one, -on -one, not doubling in that first matchup. I do wonder what do you do with Edie? And is last year now in the past for coaching staffs? Does Mark Few and this staff say, you know what, we are not worried about what Fairleigh Dickinson did. We're not worried about what happened the year before. Maybe we focus more on what Nebraska and Northwestern did this year in those wins over the Boilermakers. It's so, it's so interesting when you have a go-to guy, when you have the best player in the country, really uh, one of the best players in the history of college basketball, how does the team guard them? That's always a question coming in. I would think Mark Few, with the team that they have, they would, they would elect to go predominantly one-on-one -on -one initially. Graham Ike, 6'9", 240, physical, aggressive player. You know, not Zach Eady, but I, I think they'll uh, attempt that at start at the start, okay? And, so and try six, to take nine, away the as we do the math, that's seven inches that no, Zach Eady has on it. I think, yes, yes. What I think they'll do, though, is they start uh, two other big guys, too. Anton Watson at 6'8", mm -hmm. uh, Ben Gregg at 6'10". They bring Braden Huff off the bench at 6'10". So they have some length and some size around Ike, and I think they will try to, to, to dig down a little bit, stunt down a little bit. It's always an, uh, a matter of, well, who are you guarding? If you're guarding Trey Kaufman Wren, maybe you're, you, you, you can be more confident in digging down and maybe bringing in some, a stunt as another big. If you're guarding Mason Gillis, who's shooting almost 50% from three, you got to be more cautious doing that. But I think they'll start more in single coverage, trying to be aggressive, trying to scrape down a bit. And if they have to adjust from there, they will. But the way Purdue shares the ball, 
the way they shoot the ball, it's really hard to. And we'll see over the course of this game, can they contain him somewhat one-on-one? It's, that's been a tough task. But if they elect to, to, to bring more heat, then they're, they're shooting the three ball, and that's, that's a tough one too. It sounds to me like you like this matchup for Purdue and the Boilermakers' chances to advance to the Elite Eight. Well, I do, because you have the best player in the country who's playing so well, you know, 30 and 21 that first game, double-double in the first half of the second game of the NCAA tournament. When you can play through him, you feel really good. When you have a point guard like Braden Smith who just orchestrates this offense, complimentary players that know their role, that play to their role, I like Purdue in pretty much every game. Now, I will say Gonzaga. They start three bigs. This is a big lineup. They're two guards, though. Nolan Hickman, Ryan Neymar, those guys can go. They can create from themselves. They can create for their teammates. Hickman played the point guard last year, so he's a facilitator, creator as well. I think the matchup at point guard, Nimhart, he's a transfer from Creighton versus Brain Smith. Two very similar players. If Nimhart can get loose, he had a big game in the NCAA tournament last year against Baylor, went for like 30 points. If he does something like that, it'll be trouble for Purdue. Gonzaga plays with a fast pace. A lot of the guys can shoot the three even with their size, so that three-point line will be critical. So I do like Purdue, but this is this will be a tough one. Uh, people have been down on Gonzaga this year. They're back in the Sweet 16, had, had, had dominating wins against McNeese and, and Kansas. They're playing really well. Purdue's going to have to bring their game uh, tomorrow night. Lastly, I want to discuss legacy, and when we talk to Autumn Johnson here in a little bit, I'm going to ask her a similar question about Caitlin Clark. Zach Eady is a two-time assuming he wins it, which he will. he will be national player of the year. No one's done it in back to back years since Ralph Sampson won three in a row from 81 through 83. He will go down arguably as Purdue's greatest of all time. And big dog is there. So the question becomes nationally, does Zach Eady need a national championship or at least to get to a final four to cement his legacy as one of college basketball's all-time greats? That's a great question. I think in the Big Ten, that's solidified. He he is a legend in the Big Ten, but that would really help him nationally because I don't think the national stage has quite seen him, what he can do, and if Purdue can get to at least a Final Four, as you said, Rick, I think that does elevate him to the names of Patrick Ewing and Ralph Sampson, but getting to a Final Four at least, uh, yeah, I think he needs that on a national stage. Yeah, I think you erase all of the memories of recent NCAA tournament struggles if you get to a Final Four. I don't think you have to win it all. I think that Agreed. as good as Purdue has been this year, I think the nation still believes that UConn right now is the favorite to win the national title. Certainly understand the way that UConn finished, the way that they've played so far in the NCAA tournament. How good would that matchup be? Edie against Klingon, couple of guys on the inside. That will be so much fun. We can only wait, we can only hope, and we shall see. Obviously, a couple more teams will be eliminated from the tournament on Thursday night. Same stage, different bracket when Big Ten Today returns. Autumn Johnson joining us for an in-depth look at the women's Sweet 16 and the challenge which awaits both Iowa and Indiana. Meanwhile, in perhaps the craziest basketball news that we saw on Wednesday, the Big Three, courtesy of the legend Ice Cube, has offered Caitlin Clark five million dollars to join the league this coming season that's eight regular season games potentially two playoff games again five million dollars the math isn't hard if she plays 10 games that is half a million dollars a year by the way the WNBA rookie salary max next season is right around 75 grand with that in mind it is time for us to welcome in our good friend autumn johnson yes autumn we will talk about the ncaa tournament and iowa's matchup with colorado in just a sec but let's start with that offer i, I laid out the specifics of the financials the most that caitlin could make this year around 75 grand with the indiana fever assuming they take her number one in the draft i know a lot of stuff has to be worked out collective bargaining with the wnba all that being said isn't this something that Caitlin at least has to consider? I would personally consider it. I mean, how could you pass that up? You mentioned all of the numbers. Five million, that's a lot to leave on the table. And you mentioned, you know, the salary for um, Caitlin coming in with 75K. Of course, she's going to have her endorsements, her NIL deals, um, you know, with State Farm, with Nike, and so many other brands that are going to be paying attention to Caitlin as she enters into this next chapter. But you're looking at potentially 10 games playing with the big three, games that won't technically interfere with your season. You probably miss one game when you're looking at it when it's all said and done. That's just a 
another way to bring in some cash and another opportunity, a cool way to kind of blend the two. You're playing with, you know, former NBA players and all kind of sorts of people in that um, in that caliber. And I think the excitement that she brings, it will be really cool to see. But I know she's not going to pass up the WNBA altogether. That's been her dream. But to blend both worlds would be really cool to see. Attention for the WNBA at this point would not be a bad thing. Like P.T. Barnum said, there is no such thing as bad publicity. Of course, right now the focus is on the Sweet 16 and the matchup with Colorado. First, I want to look back, though. That second round has been the round where Iowa has had struggles over the last couple of years. It wasn't easy against West Virginia, but they got it done. Tell me what you saw good and what you saw from the not-so-good perspective against WVU. Yeah, well, let's start with the good for sure. I mean, I thought the way that they found a different way to win was obviously really good. You know, I was known for its offense, but they were able to put up a great defensive effort, mixing up different looks versus West Virginia. They limited their top two scores and J.J. Quinterly, who had 15 points and ran into some foul trouble. And also Jordan Harrison, who's their top two scorer, only had three points in that game. So I thought they did a great job of attacking the basket, get into the free throw line, and 25 of their points came from the charity stripe. Now, when you look at the bad, um, I just thought they couldn't find a consistent way to get into an offensive rhythm. And, you know, this is a team that normally hits big time shots, big time threes. And West Virginia kind of flustered that coming in with their elite ball denial. I mean, every single time Caitlin tried to, you know, get the ball back into her hands, they made it hard for her. They pressured her. Iowa is known for their assists. They only had seven. They had 15 turnovers, even though they did a better job in the second half, I thought. But a season low of 64 points, no other team this season can say that, of shutting down the number one offense in the nation, holding them under 30, under their average. So, I mean, West Virginia, that's their identity. That's what they're known for. I mean, Iowa hit one field goal in the fourth quarter alone, and you only saw four players score in that matchup in a Hawkeye jersey. Caitlin had half of those points, and she was needed for that. And we've been saying all season long, you know, who's going to be that running mate, that consistent running mate alongside Caitlin Clark. And when it's tournament time, will the supporting cast step up? We saw that in the Big Ten tournament. We're going to need to see that moving forward if this team wants to get back to that championship game. Especially with the struggles of Kate Martin, two of seven from the field. Gabby Marshall didn't score at all. Good thing that Hannah Stolke and Sydney Falter combined for 25 and 18. And now it's Colorado, a team that Autumn, to be honest, I think most folks in the Big Ten don't know a lot about. What should we know about the Buffaloes and the roster that Iowa will take on in the round of 16? Rick, they are a scary five seed. Um, you know, they've hit some bumps in the road. They had hosting rights when it was all said and done when the committee revealed their first and second um, top 16 reveal, but they hit some bumps in the road. They had a rough January, and you look at the Pac-12, it's stacked over there, and that's what they ran into constantly, but they were able to come out with the win over Stanford and USC, and even if you look at the first game of the season, they knocked off LSU, and that's what put them on the maps and they were ranked number 20 originally they went right up into the top 10 they kept climbing into the top five but that february really got to them but this is a very experienced group who brings back four starters i have my bracket from last year up here we're going to see a rematch from last year's sweet 16 so these two teams are very familiar with each other they're balanced in offense. Jalen Sherrod is one of the most clutchest players that I've seen in women's college basketball. When the game's on the line, you want the ball in her hands. Brita Foreman had a, an incredible game in that last week's 16 matchup when we saw these two teams face off. She can shoot the lights out when it comes to the three. You got Maddie Nolan, who I wish should be very familiar with. She played at Michigan, great three-point shooter and score, and just a veteran that you can, you know, um, confide in and just make sure that she's consistent at all times. Quay Miller, she can stretch the floor. She can bang down low. She can do whatever you need her to do. And Arnette Von Ley is one of the most efficient bigs in the country. So they're a very physical team. Um, another great defensive team that Iowa's going to have to go up against. And they're going to come in with the chip on their shoulder knowing they lost by 10 points last year. Autumn, there's always a part of the population that tries to knock down greatness for whatever reason. And we've seen that with some criticism of Caitlin Clark as of late. Those who say she shoots too often, she doesn't get her teammates involved, she pouts a little bit too much. 
Whatever side of that argument you're on, there's no question that statistically she is the greatest women's player of all time. How badly does she need to win a national title to be universally considered the greatest women's player of all time? I agree. She's the most exciting basketball player we've seen, period. I mean, the best scorer of all time. Um, she's the best passer we've seen. She's the only player in college basketball can, that can say they've scored over 3,000 points and passed out over 1,000 dimes in back-to-back -back seasons. Trey Young did it, but only for one season. So both men's and women's side, she's just dominating the college scene right now. She's broken every single record. We even saw in that West Virginia game, she had 32 points, which broke the record as the most points scored in a single season D1 women's basketball history. So there's no more records left. Maybe. I don't even know what's out there left for her. But, you know, the championship title to her name is all she's missing to submit her legacy and you know people and all the naysayers they will mention the greats as they should i bring this up all the time too when you have brianna stewart cheryl miller candace parker diana tarazi you may you think of all the pillars in women's basketball and a championship is to their names if caitlin clark wins a national championship there's no ifs there's no ands there's no buts that she's one of the goats especially in the fashion that she's doing it in just having an iconic senior year and as a five-star recruit coming in um willing her team to this win you've seen a lot of teams get this done but caitlin clark if you don't have her on this iowa team they're not in this conversation like the way she's able to catapult her team to greatness so I think if she can end her season off with a national championship trophy, she doesn't have to prove anyone wrong of anything else because she's already amazing and she's already done so much to cement her legacy. But a national championship would silence all the naysayers for sure. Hawkeyes are certainly favorites against Colorado. You can't say the same about the other Big Ten team inside the Sweet 16, and that's Indiana. No fault of the Hoosiers' own. They just happen to be matched up with the overall number one seed and the unbeaten South Carolina Gamecocks. Now, Mackenzie Holmes was phenomenal in her final home game as a Hoosier in the second round. I guess the one piece of bad luck for Holmes, she's been something in the shadow of Caitlin Clark playing basically her entire career at the same time. Autumn, what should Mackenzie Holmes' legacy be? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that shadow. This is a player that could have been the Big Ten player of the year if Caitlin Clark was in another conference, in my opinion. You know, Mackenzie Holmes is going to go down as one of the best to wear a Hoosiers jersey. She's the Indiana's all-time leading scorer. She's one of the best and most efficient posts in the country. She's an All-American. She's a 2023 Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. And this is a girl from Maine that we're talking about. And Indiana has just truly embraced her as one of their own. And she, you could see that whenever she ran into the stands in her last final game playing in Assembly Hall, like they ran up into the stands and they truly just embraced her. She's changed that program from top to bottom. You know, Mackenzie Holmes came in wanting to be better. She wanted to be defensive minded and she did that and more, but definitely one of the best to go down in a Hoosiers jersey. And if she gets past South Carolina, we can have another conversation about this because I mean, if you take down South Carolina, your path should be pretty clear and you look at region by region, they can be able to match up with anybody in this nation. All right, Autumn, so we have about a minute left, so let's go there. It would be considered a major upset. What are the ingredients that go into the recipe for a Hoosier upset over South Carolina? Yeah, South Carolina is tough. The only undefeated team in the nation. Um, they haven't had a bad game all season. They have scoring from top to bottom. I can argue that they're even better from last year. And for those ingredients, you have to be a great rebounding team coming into this one, knowing that you know, South Carolina grabs 47 rebounds per game. They're top three in the nation. You got to bring your best defense going up against this South Carolina team who has endless depth. They're the top two offense in the nation. They bring such elite shooting beyond the arc, bringing in Tahina Pow Pow. They have Raven Johnson. They have Breezy Hall. They have so many three-point weapons that you have to shut down. They have to have help defense knowing that, you know, South Carolina's size, physicality, and endless front court rotation is lethal, um, especially helping out Mackenzie Holmes down low. I mean, she's going to go up against 6'7", Camilla Cardoso. 
I mean, 6'3", Ashlyn Watkins is down there. They have to stay disciplined when it's all said and done because South Carolina is going to look to draw those fouls. They want to get downhill at all costs, and all starters for Indiana is going to be needed in this matchup. Great stuff, as always, from Autumn Johnson. You want to know how good she is? Look over her right shoulder there. There are no markers through any lines of that bracket. That means she must be perfect <laughs> heading into the Sweet 16. Autumn, we appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it is time for today's big interview. As you may have guessed, Reagan Kirk is joining us now from OSU. Reagan, let's start at the end because those final minutes, especially in a one nothing game, always so tense for a goaltender. You make a save with a minute 15 left. You have to make another with 28 seconds left. What are those last 20 seconds like for a goalie as you're watching the clock tick down with that one nothing lead? Yeah, I think the last seven minutes once uh, Joy scored were probably the longest seven minutes of my life. But you just try to try to bear down. And we played really great defense the whole game, but especially uh, after Joy scored. And then as the clock was ticking down, I think I thought it was icing originally at the play. And, and then with everybody storming off the bench, it was just an incredible feeling. Any national championship is epic. But for a goaltender to do it in shutout fashion, how much more special did that make it for you? Oh, extremely special, and especially since it's my last uh, college game, too, and just with the group that we had this year was incredible, and um, I couldn't have asked for a better finish. Let's discuss that group. You had 35 wins this season and obviously the national championship. What did make this particular group so successful? I just think how everybody bought in, even with uh, a lot of transfers and a lot of people who had never been at that Frozen Four stage yet. Just um, I think we all knew, especially after that Friday game going into uh, Sunday, that you know, we were going to win this thing and we were going to get it done and nobody had any doubt. And we just worked so hard all year and we were number one for a reason. I mentioned this meeting with Wisconsin was the sixth time that you guys had faced off over the course of the year four in the regular season, one in the conference tournament, and then again in the national championship game. How much did that fuel what this rivalry has become between these two programs? Yeah, I think it definitely built all year. And then even after last year losing in the final game, um, I think we had a chip on our shoulder from last year and then obviously in the conference final as well. And we we knew what it took to win that game and everybody just bought in and um, really sold it out. I think we had, you know, 17 block shots, which is incredible. And I'm just yeah super proud of how hard the girls worked this past weekend. The most well attended national championship game, I believe, in women's hockey history. How would you describe the environment in Durham when you guys were able to take it home? Yeah, we had definitely a lot of Ohio fans, too, which was incredible. I think it was the third highest attendance record since uh, 2006, probably. Um, I think just the environment and both bands were there, too. So they were battling it out. And um, yeah, you just you couldn't hear yourself think a few times, but it was just incredible. And we feed off that energy as well. So it helped us, I think. In the first five games that you played against Wisconsin, when you add up the total goals, the goal differential over the course of five games was Ohio State plus one. So for a goaltender, knowing it's going to be that tight and understanding how well you know the opponent and how well the opponent knows you, what was your key between the pipes? Yeah, they're definitely an offensively strong team, but I just try and focus on what I can control. Um, obviously, I can't go down and score for our girls, but I just knew it was coming, especially in that third period, and just try and make all the saves that I can and um, really battle it out in front and get the whistles that we need to get those quick changes, too. You mentioned Joy. You meant Joy Dunn, the National Freshman of the Year who had that game winner with about seven minutes to go. Saw her every day during practice. What makes her skill set so special? I think just the work that she puts in. You know, she comes to goalie world. She's constantly working on that shot um, and the size she has, too. Um, she's just really going to do great things for this program. And I'm excited to follow along and, and uh, yeah, see all the great things she's going to do. Let's learn a little bit about you personally, you're from a small town in Manitoba, I believe about 40 kilometers from Winnipeg, and yet you started your college career at Robert Morris in Pennsylvania. Tell me about how that process worked from the high school days to the recruiting and then your eventual transfer from Robert Morris to Ohio State. Yeah, so I played for the East Van Selects back home in Manitoba. I didn't really have many offers out of high school. Um, I think Robert Morris is really probably my only Division One offer, and I was extremely excited to just get the chance to play division one hockey and um, played two years there before the program got cut, uh, unfortunately, and then had to enter the transfer portal and strong believer that everything happens for a reason. And, you know, I wouldn't be here without the support I've had um, back home. And then also with my time at Robert Morris. 
Obviously, you're also willing to come in a year ago and, and bide your time appearing in only a handful of games. What was that year like for you in terms of learning Coach Muzzerall's process and developing yourself into the goaltender that you eventually became? Yeah, I, I knew it was going to be a process, and they had really great goaltending gear, and I was going to have to really – um, you know, showcase myself and work hard day in and day out on and off the ice. And the support I've had from the coaching staff and the team has been incredible. And I think I really just proved myself this year and just ran with it. And the girls trusted me and I had confidence in them. They had confidence in me. And that, that you know, makes a huge difference. Now, you share your hometown, St. Anne, with one of Team Canada's all-time greatest and the woman who you list on your bio as your all-time favorite athlete, Bailey Bram, who, after playing for Canada, went into coaching and actually became the first ever full-time female coach in the AHL. Any interest for you in eventually going down that coaching route? Possibly, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to play pro hockey first and, um, you know, see where that journey takes me. But, you know, coaching is always, you know, in the picture, especially as a goaltender, too. And being a female, um, you know, doing something back home would be huge. There's been great role models, including Bailey, for me. Um, so being able to be that for somebody, you know, a younger girl would be incredible. Obviously, next week is also the Women's World Championships to take place in Utica, New York. Uh, you won gold and you were the MVP at the U18s about five years ago. So I know you're very dialed in to what Team Canada is going to be doing. What are you going to be doing uh, during the week that they're playing in Utica? Yeah, we'll definitely be watching and supporting. We have quite a few Buckeyes that are, you know, trying out for those positions right now. Um, they had to leave pretty much two days after the national championship game. We're so excited for them. I will definitely be cheering for Canada, um, but obviously have a soft spot for the Buckeyes too. So. so what exactly is next for you? Obviously, you've played your final college game, getting ready to finish up in Columbus. What's Reagan Kirk's next step? Uh, definitely graduating first in May um, and then hopefully, you know, declaring in the draft sometime soon and hoping to be a small part of that that journey and just you know how much success they've had this year. I know it's continued to grow and just the fact that I can say that I'm going to hopefully declare like is incredible. Um, so, yeah, really excited for the next step. Great to catch up with Reagan Kirk, most outstanding player of the 2024 Women's Frozen Four and a newly minted national champion. Reagan, really appreciate the time. Nice to learn a little bit about you and best of luck with everything moving forward. Thank you so much. You all noticed that Matt Painter was not laughing. He was not joking. I think he was being dead serious. And I'm not sure that I can disagree with a single thing that he said. Rafael Davis on this bandwagon as well saying, People hate greatness, that the hate he sees about Zach Eady and Caitlin Clark, it is unbelievable. Yes, sometimes it's not real people, but there are full-grown adults out there sending this hate into the world just because they are trying to bring down those at the top of the heap to their level. I'm not just okay with what Matt Painter said. I am a big fan of what Matt Painter said. I'm willing to take the test, coach, if you want. <laughs> Trent will pass. He'll do better than I will but I think I can get a passing grade as well. I guess I understand that people don't like when someone is as dominant as Zach Eadier in the women's game, Caitlin Clark, but I also think that most of those people that are sending out that criticism are only doing it because they know they can do it on social media and they're not going to be held accountable. And that's it. Well, of course, with social media, that's the case. I, I love Coach Painter sticking up for his guys, especially this point in the year. You know, you, you love to see that. And I think just across the board, we've watched – Zach Eady, we've watched Caitlin Clark be so dominant, so good, have so much attention on them and thrive through it all that I think just people like to pick it apart now. People, you know, when people, when you see greatness, you like to attack that. And that's just, that's what we're seeing, unfortunately, as opposed to, hey, appreciating how good they are. And to do it, you look at Caitlin Clark and the spotlight and the pressure Night after night, that is so difficult. The attention on her, the attention on Zach Eady from, you know, sometimes three, four defenders on him, you know, or, or fans, whatever it may be, to, to perform at that level night after night, it's incredible to see. I love his coach sticking up for them. And that's, sadly, that's kind of how our society is. We like to, to hate on greatness. Instead, what we should be doing is realizing how ridiculous it is that we consider it commonplace when Caitlin goes for 30, 10, and 10 pretty much every night, and Zach goes for 30 and 15 or 18 every night. These are video game numbers, and they're doing them against the best in the country. Speaking of the best in the country and the players that will try to slow down Zach Eady and other Big Ten players, we're going to focus on the men's bracket now with Eady and Terrence Shannon of Illinois. For Eady, as you look at not just Friday night's game, 
but also the path that Purdue would have to get to the Final Four. Is there a player or two that could stand in the big fellow's way? Well, there's a few. The, the, the last thing I'd say is, you know, if we could see the work that these players put oh, in. every day. You know, they're so good because they work so hard, they make it look easy. But there's a lot of work on the front end of that that makes it look easy under the spotlight. But, you know, getting to this men's tournament, I, I think what's really exciting about Zach Eady, how dominant he's been, he could face some legitimate big men coming up. Okay, if, if they win this game against Gonzaga, their next opponent could be Creighton. They have a big fella, Ryan Kalkburner, 7'1", 270, moves his feet well, over 17 points a game. This is a good player, and defensively, he is very, very solid. You know, if they could get past that, that game and you look into the Final Four, you know, NC State would probably be kind of a miracle run, but DJ Burns, or big fella, is good. Uh, Marquette, though, who they also, also have played, Iso Igodaro. Kind of a, a 6'11 point center at times. That would be an intriguing matchup. But I'm going to go then finally what I think a lot of people would love to see. UConn is on this, this, uh, this tour of doing it again, back-to-back. -back, and Purdue's on this redemption tour. If those two teams met, Donovan Klingon, their big guy, 7'2", 280, uh, can move really well against Northwestern, 14 points, 14 rebounds, 8 blocks. He had 22-16 against Marquette in the Big East Championship. I think seeing those two head-to-head, -head, yep. that's what we want to see. Talk about a heavyweight matchup for the national title. I would love to see it. All right, same question, but we move to a different quadrant of the bracket. The East, where Illinois is, they'd have to get through UConn, obviously, before they were to get to the Final Four. And their star, Terrence Shannon Jr., not many have slowed down or stopped TSJ on his way to the hoop. Who are some guys that could slow him down at the least? Because as dominant as Zach Eadie's in the low post, I mean, Terrence Shannon equally as dominant in transition, attacking the basket. Um, and for, for Shannon, you know, he's got a tough match against Iowa State's team defense tonight. If you get past them, you're looking at UConn. UConn has a couple guys. Uh, Stephen Castle, freshman, will be a lottery pick next year. Tristan Newton, probably their best player. Really did a, did a superb, as good of a job as I've seen against Boo Booey. I know Shannon's a different beast um, going up to defending him. But those two guys for UConn are really stout on both ends of the floor and, and what they can do offensively as well. Then if you advance, of course, you're going to face some other, some other tough guys, whether it's North Carolina with yep. their, their point guard in R.J. Davis, obviously big guy in Arm Arm Armando Baycat. There's, there's great players on the other side of the court. Um, Dalton Connect for Tennessee is a big-time player. So there's a lot of what's, – what's great is we well, see – Well, you the didn't mention the potential of Illinois and Purdue – Getting together. Well, that would be fun. That, that would be so much fun for us. And if that, that would be third time. We'll see if third time's a charm for Illinois. But, heck, you know, they got, they got the big fella Edie on that end of the floor, too. Yeah, it would be round three. That's one of the cliches that I absolutely hate. It's really hard to beat a team a third time in the same season. It's harder to beat them the third time than it was It's hard to beat anybody, the any first good team, time, just once, yeah. Or the second time. Best part about the NCAA tournament, doesn't matter what happened in the past. You win, you advance, you lose, you go home. Speaking of going home, I guess that kind of wraps it up for us, but we're not going home. For Trent Meacham, I'm Rick Pizzo. As always, we appreciate you spending some time with us and for the hang here on Big Ten Today.